Hello and welcome to the History of the Germans, episode 99. Follow the money. This week we stumble into the next imperial succession, where the Saxons are again standing on the sidelines. On paper, the new guy, Conrad II, was a man after their own heart, fearsome warrior, untroubled by bookish learning. But he was also a sponsor of the church. His son, Henry III, was even more so, and there are many reasons why the Saxon magnates did not like the ecclesiastical princes. And it is not just about them greedily gobbling up lands and privileges, but they're also hitting them where it matters most. The economy, stupid. Before we start, let me tell you that the History of the Germans podcast is advertising free, thanks to the generous support from patrons. And you can become a patron too, and enjoy exclusive bonus episodes and other privileges from the price of a latte per month. All you have to do is sign up at patreon.com slash historyofthegermans, or on my website, historyofthegermans.com. you find all the links in the show notes. And thanks a lot to Alexander G., John P., James B., and Jeremy H., who've already signed up. Last week we saw a rift opening up between the Saxon magnates and the Emperor Henry II. Henry II had called an end to the long-standing policy of a close alliance between Poland and the Empire. The ruler of Poland, Boleslaw the Brave, had built an empire that at some point included the marches of Lusatia and Meissen, as well as Bohemia. Henry II opposed him and, in this struggle, allied himself with the Lutizzi, a federation of pagan Wendish tribes. This deeply irritated the Saxon magnates who by now had forged close links to the Polish nobility and its ducal house. Henry's campaigns ultimately failed and in 1018 he had to conclude the Peace of Bautzen that confirmed Boleslav's control of Lusatia, Moravia and Silesia, though not the core of Bohemia and not Meissen. Boleslav the Brave then turned east and conquered Kiev on behalf of his son-in-law, Sviatopolk the Accursed. No, he did not stay long and mostly came for the plunder, but that was still quite cool. What was not quite as cool was that Boleslav the Brave decided that he was now big enough to go up one rank on the feudal hierarchy and crowned himself King of Poland. That was simply unacceptable to the Emperor, not the King bit, but the bit of doing it without imperial permission. Emperor Henry II was however unable to do anything about it, mainly because he was dead which gets us to the next succession crisis. Emperor Henry II, like his predecessor Otto III, had no children, none at all. In fact, the Ottonian family had managed to get so haughty, they had decided not to let any of their daughters get married to mere mortals, but made them brides of Christ, living their lives as eminent abbesses. And as for sons, they were so thin on the ground, there was simply not a single male descendant of Henry the Fowler anywhere. And that makes for a free election, where in principle any magnate with a reputation for brutality in war and regular donations to the church could throw in his hat. And one of those would then be elected by the dukes, counts, bishops and abbots of the kingdom. This election took place in Camba on September 4, 1024. Now here is an interesting thing. The Saxons did not even show up for the election. Instead, Their magnates held an assembly a few weeks earlier where they decided to stay neutral. None of the chroniclers explain why they did that, and Vipo, the usually best informed of them, does even say the Saxons had been at Camber, though we know for a fact they definitely weren't. Why would they do that? Well, this has to do with the way a royal election is designed. It is not an election as we know it, where two or more candidates canvass for votes and then one ends up getting the majority. No, the idea of a medieval royal election is to identify and then confirm the candidate who is already chosen by God. That means the princes would discuss the merits of the various candidates in the run-up to the actual voting process, but the vote itself was always unanimous. That created a huge bandwagon effect, since the vote was public and was done in order of seniority. The first to vote was the Archbishop of Mainz. Bearing in mind that the vote had to be unanimous, it meant that once the archbishop had cast his vote, everyone else had to fall in line behind him. This process forced the participants into a game of three-dimensional chess. As the fortunes of the different candidates are in flux, there is a point in time where throwing your weight behind the ultimate successful candidate is the best strategy to get favours from the future emperor. 
But if you leave it too late, the benefits of doing so diminish as the future winner is less and less dependent on your support. That is the moment where the supporters of the defeated candidates leave the assembly. The winner is then voted for unanimously, but he still needs to consolidate his reign. Those who had left will now negotiate the terms of their submission to the new ruler, which is a way to get at least some of their rights and privileges confirmed. Or if one is very powerful, even granted new ones. And that was the calculation of the Saxons even before the election had begun. They might have wanted to put forward their own candidate, but they probably could not agree on one amongst themselves. They had a duke, Bernard Billung. He was very powerful, but he did not have the kind of tight control over the duchy that, for instance, Henry II had over Bavaria. And there were now other powerful magnates, including the three Markgrafs of Meissen, Lusatia and the Northern Marches, and the Counts of Stade and Ballenstedt. Without a unified vote for one Saxon candidate, the best option was to stick together as one powerful bloc would then extract concessions from the new ruler. And that they did. Saxony was confirmed in its special status as it had been when Henry II had to do the same thing 20 odd years earlier. What that special status was is not quite clear, but you can assume that, given the imperial archives of Patchy to say it politely, there's a good chance the Saxons were able to extract special freedoms beyond whatever they traditionally might have had. In summary, the Saxons accepted the fact that they no longer determined who was king, but at least they got a good deal out of the election process, or so they thought. And what made the deal even more attractive was that the new emperor was, in their eyes, a major upgrade on Henry II. The new guy, Conrad II, was the diametrical opposite of his predecessor. Where Henry II was a fragile health, Conrad was a bear of a man. Henry was a bookish sword, originally destined for the church and an accomplished theologian. Conrad's main communication tool was the sword. And he was lucky. His first win came when Boleslav the Brave died shortly after Conrad II had ascended the throne and was succeeded by his son Mieszko II. Mieszko II was no Boleslav the Brave. In 1028, Mieszko II resumes the attack and retreat strategy his father had excelled at. His aim was to compel Conrad II to grant him the Margraviate of Meissen and or hand over the bits of Lusatia he did not yet control. But he lacked his father's panache. He never brings a full-sized army down that could defend any positions taken or fight an open battle. Instead, Mieszko's modest forces run back home as soon as Conrad II appears. Mieszko II then lures the imperial troops into the endless swamps and forests of Poland, where their horses are useless and their armor cumbersome. That is sort of a smart way to defend territory, but it's not a way to expand it. Success eluded him. Whilst his father managed to put the fear of God into all his neighbors, expanding Poland at the expense of the Empire, Bohemia and the Kievan Rus, his son lacked the authority required. Furthermore, he was not the only son of Boleslav. His brother, and I will now properly embarrass myself, called Bezprim, had contested his father's will and fled to Kiev. At that point, the Empire, the Bohemians and the Kievan Rus formed a powerful coalition to take back the lands Boleslav had conquered. The Grand Prince of the Kievan Rus attacked Poland from the north with the intention of putting Bezprim on the throne. The Duke of Bohemia came from the south taking back Moravia and the Emperor took back the county of Lusatia. In 1031 Mieszko II was expelled from Poland and his brother Bezprim was put on the throne by the Grand Prince of Kiev. Bezprim immediately reconciled with the Emperor by sending him the royal insignia of Poland, thereby renouncing the royal title. However, his reign did not last long. There are reports of riots caused partially by Bezprim's persecution of Mieszko's followers, and he was murdered after just a year. Mieszko II comes back to Poland in 1033 on the promise to end hostilities against the Empire. He submitted to Conrad at a royal assembly in Mirzeburg, where he gave up his pretensions of kingship and reverted to being a mere duke, gave up all claims on Lusatia and Meissen. Conrad II then ordered Poland to be split up amongst the three surviving members of the Piers dynasty. That separation did not last long as Mieszko II's two contenders met a violent end, but after the upheavals of the last decade, order was almost impossible to restore. The peasants revolted, pagan religion returned and aristocrats expanded their positions. 
When Mieszko II died, his wife and little son Casimir fled to the court of Conrad II. Poland was no longer a major political factor in the East for the next hundred years. Management of the Polish border was given to the last descendant of Markgraf Eckhard of Meissen, also called Eckhard. He is most famous for being married to Uta von Ballenstedt, whose sculpture on the Cathedral of Naumburg is one of the most recognizable pieces of medieval art. In the 1930s, she was appropriated both by the Nazis as the ideal Aryan woman and by Walt Disney as the evil queen in Snow White. When Umberto Eco was asked which woman of European art he would most like to spend an evening with, he replied, in first place, ahead of all others, Uta of Naumburg. Now, despite its artistic importance, this is not the most significant thing about Eckhart II of Meissen. He was one of the most important military commanders on the border and a close associate of Conrad II and later his son, Henry III. He was a man of his time and as such willing to use violence, even against members of his own family. In 1032, his brother-in-law, Dietrich, Count of Wittin, had taken over the Margraviate of Lusatia in recognition of his deeds in the war against Mieszko II. That sealed his fate. Eckhart II too had been keen on becoming Markgraf of Lusatia and so simply killed his brother-in-law. Conrad II recognized this transaction and Meissen and Lusatia were united under the murderous Eckhart II. But the Margraviate of Meissen will not remain in Eckhart's family, mainly because he and the alluring Uta did not produce any offspring. After some back and forward twists we'll hear about later, the Margraviate will end up in the hands of Dietrich's descendants, the House of Wittin, who will elevate it to the level of a kingdom and hold on to it until 1918. The story of the House of Wittin is likely to be subject of a separate episode, therefore we should for now go back to the early 11th century. The issue with the countries on the eastern side of the empire is that they are a system of communicating vassals. If one goes down, another goes up. So as Poland went down, Bohemia ascended. The Duke of Bohemia, Udalrich, had benefited materially from Jesko's weakness and recaptured Moravia, which had been lost to Boleslav the Brave 20 years earlier. He even managed to capture Miesko when he had to flee from his half-brother. This rise in Bohemian power caused concern in the empire. So when by 1033 Miesko and Poland had become embroiled in their internal infighting, Conrad sent an army under the nominal command of his son Henry III to Bohemia. Udalrich had to submit to Conrad, who deposed him. Bohemia was split up again and Udalrich was replaced by his brother, another Jaromir, whilst Moravia was given to Udalrich's son, Bratislav. By 1034, Conrad changed his mind upon pressure of Bohemian magnates and gives Udalrich the duchy to rule jointly with Jaromir. No prizes for what happens next, Udalrich takes over the whole of the duchy and blinds his brother Jaromir. I think being the brother of the Duke of Bohemia is one of the most dangerous positions to be in. Still, that is not quite what Conrad wanted, so he would have invaded Bohemia again had not the sudden death of Udalrich solved that problem. Udalrich's son, Bratislav, was made Duke of the now unified Bohemia. He paid homage to Conrad, provided hostages and promised to help with expeditions against the Slavs. Bratislav became one of Bohemia's most powerful rulers. He attacked the divided Poland several times and stole the relics of St. Adalbert from Gnezno. This led to a repeat of the previous process, i.e. the next Emperor Henry III had to intervene. In 1047, Bratislav was forced to make peace with the Poles, which put this conflict to bed. Now to round off the early salient activity in the north, we need to talk about Denmark. Last week we heard how Sven Forkbeard and his son Knut created a Viking empire that spanned Denmark, England and Norway. Conrad was able to establish a positive relationship with King Knut when the two met at his, i.e. Conrad II's, coronation in Rome in 1027. Knut had gone to Rome on some pilgrimage and by sheer coincidence was there at the same time. The two rulers seem to have hit it off, both being men of the sword. As part of that alliance, Knut accepted that the Danish bishoprics returned back under effective control of the Archbishop of Hamburg Bremen after two decades of English influence. This bromance culminated eight years later in the marriage of Conrad II's son, Henry III, to Knut's daughter Gunhilde, who was called Kunigunde in Germany. The marriage was important enough for Conrad that he offered a truly royal present to King Knut, the county of Schleswig. This is a pretty good track record for Conrad II. 
His management of the eastern frontier was so effective that his son, Henry III, could focus on issues in Italy, Lothringia and Hungary without having to think too much about how to deal with Bohemians, Poles and Danes. Which begs the question why the Saxons did not like Conrad II and his son Henry III, and I mean, not even one tiny bit. And there are a few reasons for that level of upset. The first had to do with Goslar. Goslar was originally a possession of the Ottonians, but had come to the Salian emperors when the Ottonians had died out. Goslar was incredibly important as it held the largest silver mine in Europe at the time. Henry II had already built an imperial palace there in 1005, and Henry III hugely expanded the structure. Goslar became the closest thing to an imperial capital the medieval rulers ever managed. The Pfalz itself was, and still is, an impressive edifice. And next to it stood the convent of St. Simon and St. Jude, which under Henry III was the permanent seat of the imperial chancery. Until then, the chancery had been travelling with the emperor on its perennial move from one Pfalz to the next. By creating a permanent seat, the chancery was able to establish proper, reliable archives. And once they had reliable archives, the magnates could no longer show up with some forged document that claimed they owned this or that manor house, bridge toll or salt mine, without running the risk that the chancery would dig up their corresponding copy that said none of the sort. If that professionalization of imperial administration was irritating, two more things enraged the nobles. Firstly, Conrad II and then Henry III spent a lot of time in Saxony, which meant that the Saxons were constantly required to feed the emperor and his vast entourage. Saxony became the imperial kitchen, which constantly produced meals for free. That sounds petty, but the imperial court could easily count a thousand individuals, which makes a two-week stay ruinous for the count or bishop who has to host them. The other was that Goslar was a mere 20 kilometers from the traditional Saxon palace at Verla. Verla was a large structure covering nearly 20 hectares enclosed by a stone curtain wall with two or more gates, several towers, two palaces, one of which had an underfloor heating system, etc. etc. pp. This was a place of Saxon pride, the scene of many of their assemblies and a demonstration of its ancient power. By building out Goslar, the salians cut Verla out of the equation. The Etonians had stayed in Verla 14 times, but Henry III never came there to pay his respects. He always stayed in Goslar and almost as a deliberate snub summoned the magnates of Saxony to come to his splendid new palace. A professional chancery, constant demand for food and the snubbing of their ancient traditions were issues that would have raised Saxon anger from irritated to a bit miffed, but it would not yet have driven them to distraction. What got them truly riled up was that Conrad II and even more so Henry III were consolidating political control within and over the duchy. This was done in two ways. The first was to consolidate power around Goslar with the intention to build the very first territorial power base in the empire. This process had started under Henry III but accelerated under Henry IV, which we will discuss in more detail next week. The other leg was the aggressive sponsorship of the church. It is under Conrad II and Henry III that the Ottonian Salian imperial church system reached its zenith. The basic concept was that the church infrastructure was used as part of the imperial administration. Bishops would receive not just money and lands to build churches, but they would take over entire counties to administer on behalf of the emperor. In return for this generosity, the church would be obliged to provide the emperor with material resources, in particular provide soldiers and their supplies beyond the traditional vassalage obligations. The emperor could exert significant power over the bishops as he de facto decided who would be placed on the episcopal throne. In the case of Henry III, he even did this with the popes themselves. The expansion of the church power concerned the Saxon nobles. Every time another county or large farm was moving across into church ownership, it was another county or farm that could no longer be bought inherited or taken by force. And the bishops took a proactive part in the imperial policy to curb feuds. Henry III had declared a peace of God in 1043 that severely limited the opportunities for magnates to rob their way to riches. And there is something else the Saxon magnates took issue with and that was the church's attempt to convert the Slavs in the marches. There is a section in Adam von Bremen where he explains the animosity between the Duke of Saxony 
Bernhard Billung and the Archbishop of Hamburg Bremen. Quote, From the time the Duke was installed in his post, the discord between the two houses, that of the Archbishop and that of the Duke, never stopped. The Duke attacked the King and the Church, whilst the Archbishop fought for the well-being of the Church, the fealty to the King. This conflict that had remained hidden for long grew and grew to infinity. Duke Bernard, having forgotten his grandfather's humility and his father's piety, pressed the Abodrites so hard for money that they, in their despair, returned to their pagan beliefs. End quote. Adam von Bremen then accuses the Duke of further crimes, including high treason and the destruction of churches. But what I found interesting was this point about pushing the local Slavic people back into paganism. At a later stage, Adam will get even more explicit and say that Duke and Archbishop had opposite perspectives as regards the policy towards the Slavs. The Archbishop cared mostly about gathering souls for Christendom. The Duke, on the other hand, cared only about the tribute according to Adam von Bremen. It was the avarice of the Duke that prevented the conversion of the people. That does not seem to make much sense. Why would the Duke, a pious Christian, no doubt, want to prevent the spreading of the gospel? The answer is the economy. As long as the Slavs remained pagan, the Markgrafs could demand tribute. How much tribute was in the hands of the Markgrafs since pagans had no legal standing in court? And pagans do not pay the tithe to the church, leaving more to give to the duke. And if the Wends were unwilling or unable to pay the tribute, the dukes and Markgrafs were entirely in their right to raid and plunder the lands without breaching the peace of God. And there might be another reason why it is opportune for the Saxon nobles to keep the Wends pagan. And that has to do with the slave trade. The church had banned the enslavement of Christians, even recently converted Christians, and slaves were the most profitable business on the border. If the bishops get to convert all these Hevelles, Abodrites and Lutizzi, there is no longer a reservoir of potential slaves. One would have to go to the land of the terrifying Prutzi to find more of them, and that's a long way and very dangerous. The Prutzi had recently killed their second missionary, by the way, St. Bruno of Querford, presumably because he was also carrying books that they so despised. If you look at it this way, quite a lot of things start to make sense that I could not quite get my head around the first time. It explains why the Saxon nobles actively undermined Henry II's alliance with the Lutizzi, the alliance that had taken the Lutizzi out of a pool of potential slaves and targets for pillage. It explains why they never established garrisons or rebuilt the bishoprics in the northern marches or the March of the Billungs after 983. They should have been able to, since their military expeditions were mostly successful. And it explains another story that I also never got my head around. It relates to the war with the Lutizzi in 1033. Now, In the years before the conflict, the Lutizzi had been paying their tribute, as was ordered, and they had been living peacefully, minding their own business. That changed when a Saxon count named Ludger was killed by the Slavs together with 40 of his comrades. The Slavs claimed that it was the Saxons who had provoked the fight and that they had only acted in self-defense. There were no Christian witnesses, and the emperor, on advice from his princes, proposed to determine the veracity of the respective claims through a trial by combat. That already suggests that the emperor was sympathizing with the Slavs because normally the Slavs wouldn't have been able to stand in court. Forced into the trial by combat, the Saxons put up a fighter who was full of the Christian faith, but, as the chronicler Vipo said, did not take seriously that God is the truth and decides all and everything in the proper judgment. The heathens, on the other hand, put up a fighter whose one and only focus was the truth. The Slav fought hard and fair until the Christian defender was hit and fell. The judgment was clear for all to see the Lutizzi had not given any reason for the Saxons to attack them. So, the Saxons had to abandon their expedition, and to pacify the border, Conrad built a strong fortification at Verben on the Elbe River. The following year, war broke out. Now this time the Saxons say that the Lutizzi had taken the castle of Verben by treachery and killed or captured the garrison left there by Conrad. That may have been true, or we have an early version of the Gleiwitz incident. This time, there is no trial. Conrad is made to mobilize his army and enters the territory east of the Elbe River. His army burns and devastates the land until only the strongest fortifications and towns remain in the hands of the Lutizzi. Everything else is carried away by the raiders. 
no wonder the Wends feel little warmth to their oppressors, and if they have to die anyway, they prefer to do so believing in their old gods. The churchmen have a lot of sympathy for their plight and work on preventing these raids. The dominant church figure in Saxony after 1043 is Adalbert, Archbishop of Hamburg Bremen, who embodies this spirit perfectly. Adalbert was from one of the major Saxon clans, the Counts of Gozek. His brothers became the Counts Palatinate of Saxony, which means they were the Counts administrating the royal territories within the duchy. Adalbert and his brothers were very much the eyes and ears of Henry III in the duchy. Adalbert had also a very close personal relationship with Henry III. Like the emperor, he had great ambitions. Adalbert saw himself and his archbishopric as the patriarch of the north, tasked with bringing Christendom to all the shores of the Baltic. That includes being the superior of all the bishoprics in Denmark, Norway, Sweden, as well as any future bishoprics to be established there or in what is now Finland, Russia and the Baltic states. His ambition was to convert the souls and make himself their spiritual guide. Raiding and rounding up women and children as slaves did not feature in his plans. In 1047, the Saxons in general and their ducal house, the Billungs, had enough of Goslar, of centralization, of disregard for their ancient traditions, but foremost for the preferment of the church that was getting in the way of their livelihood. Henry III had gone to a royal estate in Saxony called Lesum to meet with Archbishop Adalbert. Lesum was a bit of a red rag as well, since Conrad II had taken it off the Billungs under some legal pretext ten years earlier. Whilst the Emperor and the Archbishop met the Billungs, Duke Bernard II and his brother Tietmar come around with a large retinue. During this probably rather uneasy stay, one of Tietmar's vassals, a certain Arnold, confides in the Archbishop that Tietmar's plan was to kill the Emperor. Arnold is made to accuse Tietmar openly which results in another trial by combat. There's no evidence on either side, so God is to decide. Tietmar is happy to go along, maybe less on the grounds of actual innocence, but more on his recognized prowess with the sword. Anyway, the Lord reveals that Tietmar has been lying by means of Arnold's sword sticking out of his back. There is no record of how Bernard II explains the situation to his overlord, but not much happens to him. Henry III may not yet have enough assets in place to take the Duke of Saxony on directly. And there's an epilogue to the story. A few years later, Tietmar's son captures his father's killer and has him strung up between two dogs. That gets Henry III involved again. The son is exiled for life and his lands are given to the Bishop of Halberstadt, further undermining the power of the magnates in Saxony. By the time Henry III died in 1056, the rift between the Saxons and the imperial Salian house had deepened to the point of open enmity. Only the undeniable strength of Henry III, the arguably most powerful medieval emperor of all time, holds things in check. But nobody lives forever. And when Henry III leaves behind a small boy as his heir and an inept regent to run the empire for the next decade, the Saxons are getting ready to strike. How that works out, we will hear next week. I hope you will join us again. And in the meantime, if you want to hear more about the reign of Conrad II and Henry III, listen again to the episodes 22 to 29. Ah, and another thing. As you hear this, I will be sailing somewhere in the middle of the Atlantic. If you want to follow along, you can do so on our website and app called Marine Traffic. Search for sailing vessel Purple Rain under French flag. Now, what this journey means, apart from working like a dervish to get enough episodes recorded to cover the time, it also means that my marketing efforts trickle down to zero. Hence, I would hugely appreciate if you were to help promote the show. Why not send a link to the history of the Germans to a friend or family member who might be interested? Write a comment or share one of my older posts which tend to revive them, or even write your own posts on social media. That would be massively, massively appreciated as would obviously signing up on Patreon at patreon.com slash historyofthegermans. As always, you find all the links in the show notes.